Um, man, I'll tell you, I was going to preach through John 3.16 today, uh, but for some reason, I really felt like I needed to go in a different direction. And so I hope that this message today really inspires you and encourages you, um, and that it gives you the wisdom to not only know what to do through the end of this year, but that you'll take some good steps at the beginning of the year. Because how many of you know how you end one year often dictates how you start another? And so my hope is that this word will not only be encouraging to your soul, but that it will give you the wisdom and the help that you need so that 2024 can be one of the best years you've ever had in your life. And so why don't you join me? I'm in James, the fifth chapter. James, the fifth chapter is going to jump up on your screen. This is what it says. It says, be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, being patient until he receives the early and the latter rain. Yet also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And do not grumble against one another's brothers so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge stands at the door. And as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider it best blessed those who remain steadfast. You have heard the steadfastness, steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord and how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your great word that not only gives us wisdom, but helps point us to your son, Jesus, who was born in a manger during this time in whose birth we celebrate. Jesus, I pray that you would bless those under the sound of my voice. May this message draw us closer to you. Lord, may it draw attention to you as the only wise Savior of the world. And so, Lord, we love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, technology has transformed the way we experience waiting right now. Because of companies like Google, Apple, and Amazon, they've created like this highly digital, personalized world in which you and I are the rulers of it, right? Think about it like this. Every song, every show, and every movie ever made in history is instantly accessible. Every 17 social media apps, all you have to do is swipe one way and they all pop up. Are you looking for some Thai food in the middle of the night? Well, guess what? There's an app for that. If you're looking for last minute Christmas gift, that's one tap away. What's happened with us is we've become so accustomed to a click and go lifestyle where almost every human need, regardless of nature, can be instantly satisfied with little to no waiting at all. Be because of 5G, and shout out to 5G because I don't like my internet working slowly. Because of 5G, because of the fiber optic network, it seems like waiting for something to happen has become a thing of the past because you and I live in something called the instant gratification culture, where everything is convenient, everything is quick, and everything is at our fingertips. And I'm going to be honest with you, I love it in some ways. Because why wait to get something on Amazon in two days when you can get it same day? Why go and fight in the holiday season at Walmart when you can get Walmart Plus and it's there in two to three hours, amen, somebody? So no point of that. It's, it's, it's amazing. But with all the beauty of this instant gratification culture, what you and I would like to admit also that it does have some downsides, doesn't it? Dr. Paul Brand, who is an orthopedic surgeon, who's worked in Asia and has worked in America throughout all of his years, he notes this. He says, people in technologically advanced societies live at a greater comfort level, but there seems to be they are far less equipped to handle suffering, as, and when suffering does come, they are much more traumatized by it. On top of that, a recent article by Psychology Today builds upon this notion. It says that people are more anxious now than they've ever been in their lives. People are being prescribed more medication to deal with clinical issues more than ever. And they said that the reason this happens is because frustration catapults into a crisis immediately. So as soon as something bad happens or a desire is not fulfilled, it eventually leads to a crisis. 
But let me just tell you, friends, that that middle ground between promise or desire and fulfillment needs to be filled by something called patience, by patience, right? That it, and it's something that we're lacking in our click and go culture. But let, let's be honest, though. The lack of patience is not just buffering or buffeting our mental health. For those who are curious about exploring a relationship with God, it also has tremendous effects on our relationship with him as well. Because if you've been following God or you're trying to explore what it is to follow Jesus, here's one of the first lessons that you will learn is that God does not move at the speed of the algorithm. He does not move on our timelines, but he moves on his another timeline altogether. And, and, and if we can be honest, I know some of us haven't been in church in a while, so I'm not going to beat you up here. I'm happy you're here. Merry Christmas. You look great with your festive colors. But, but I will say, if we're honest, the reason that some of us have drifted away from God and we have drifted away from the church in some instances is because we've tried to give God a conditional try. We said, God, if you do this thing for me, I promise that I will follow you. So we decided finally to muster up the strength to pray for something. And when it didn't happen, as we hope, many of us got discouraged about it. We're like, well, if he's not listening to me now, he won't ever listen to me. We got discouraged about it. We lost patience. And eventually, we began to distrust the worthiness of our faith. For some of us, it's not that you are, are walking away from the church. You haven't totally walked away. You've done something called quiet quitting, where you do just enough to, like, make it in to heaven, but not enough to really engage and develop and cultivate a relationship with God. And so you might listen to a sermon series or a sermon from time to time because you want to be uplifted, or you might listen to some, some worship music because you want to be inspired. But, but here's the thing. Here's the ultimate problem that we run into is that the reason that some of us have walked away or quiet quit on God is because we have projected our cultural expectations onto him. We have expectations that happens in this click and go culture, and when God does not meet those expectations on our timeline, many times we are ready to desert the faith altogether. But here's what I want you to know, friends. God does not only not move at the speed of the algorithm, but he does not deliver promotion like Instacart. He does not provide you next day air deliverance for every situation in your life. He, he does, he's not like UPS. Like he does not give you what you want, when you want it, how you want it, because he is not beholden to or confined to our click and go culture. And it's because part and parcel is that when you are patient, God is trying to cultivate and develop something in you that doesn't happen necessarily when things are readily available all the time. Are y'all hearing me today, church? And so what I want to do, this is what I want to do today. Firstly, I want to tell us what patience is, and I want to show us how to cultivate patience. Is that okay? So I'm going to situate this in the book today, and then I'm going to preach, right? Uh, this book is actually a letter that was written to a bunch of churches in the Mediterranean region in the, first, in the first century. It was written by Jesus's little brother, James. And James begins his book in chapter one, verse two, and he says, count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you deal with various trials of different kinds, because you know God is testing your steadfastness or your patience. But before he ends the book, he bookends it with another imperative or command right here in chapter 5, verse 7. He says, therefore, be patient to the coming of the Lord. Now, the, what does it mean to be patient? The, the word that he uses is very intriguing. It's a compound word. So it means that he takes two words and kind of puts them together like toothpaste, basketball. You know what I'm saying? He, he kind of does that. And, and what he, the word he uses is the word large heat, large heat. It's the word makra through mayo. It means like something, enduring something for a long period of time that is not a lot of fun and that can feel unbearable. Large heat. Now, I don't know about you, but it's cold outside right now. So heat is a good thing. But too much heat becomes what? Unbearable. That's why you stick your leg outside the covers at night. 
Because if you stay in the cover, all of the covers, it gets too hot. It becomes unbearable. It becomes uncomfortable. And many of us know about the un- dis- discomfort, don't we? Not only physically, but you know about the discomfort in your relationships. Some of us right now are experiencing some discomfort, some heat in our relationships because uh, we just keep on having issue after issue, maybe with our spouse or our significant other or friend. We're experiencing stress. Maybe you're experiencing the large heat right now because you're at your job and it seems like your coworkers are always trying to undermine you. Maybe you're in college and you're trying to navigate through what it looks like to kind of have a social life, but also preparing for the future. You're experiencing large heat. And James is saying in this passage that I want you to endure the perplexity, the pressures, and the paradoxes, and the pain of life with joy. Patience is developing or cultivating the ability to deal with delays and troubles and suffering and do it with a great attitude. But you don't just need patience for difficult seasons of life. You need patience with people, don't you? Well, we don't need patience with people? Okay, all right. We got the greatest people in our life, so I'll just go through this quickly. You need, I I, I heard a neurologist say that there are a thousand or a hundred billion nerve endings in our bodies. And yet your coworker can get all, all of them simultaneously. <laughs> Every last one. From the top of your head to the bottom of your head. It's like I've communicated my expectations as my employee, but you still are not meeting the standard. You are getting on my nerves. Uh, I'm working diligently, not only doing my job, but I'm doing your job. James is saying, be patient. You've done raised this child, bought him into the world, Pay for them to have a great life on your dime. And what do they do? Test your patience every day. Oh, y'all, oh, oh. Well, I'm just going to start a new sermon series called Help, I'm a Parent. Patience. I've told you 50, 11 times. To keep this house clean, flush the toilet, but you just won't listen. This is what James is saying, have patience. Be patient. I know you're tired of your family members. You're going to sit around the table with them at Christmas, and some of you haven't talked to your family members in months on end. And so you are mentally, y'all not amen in that part, you amen the kids part. <laughs> you, you like, yes, pastor, yes, these kids. The family member is not so much. I know they don't listen to you. This is what James is saying. Have patience. Be patient. Because maybe they're just not there yet. Here's the thing. You have to be patient and allow people some time to grow up and mature because somebody was patient with you as you grew up and matured. Somebody took their time with you. You weren't always made up like you are now with everything together. Like, I know that you got it together now. Oh, you're emotionally present. Hallelujah. You had your little quiet times. You're going to therapy now. Look at you. Working on your internal person. But here's the thing. You wasn't always that way. I know you frugal now, but there was a time when you spent money simply because you thought it was going to give you significance. He's saying, be patient with other people like God has been patient with you. If you're a follower of Jesus in here, God has been patient with you while you were sinning and enjoying all of those things that the world had to offer. But he didn't crack the whip, and he didn't, he didn't punish you. He was patient with you. Are you hearing me? So we need to be patient in difficult seasons. We need to be patient with people, and we need to be patient with difficult decisions that we have to make. Some of us have some really important decisions that we have to make in 2024. Do I stay at this job or do do I go to another job? Do I retire and spend time with my grandkids or do I keep working? Do I go to this college or that college? Do I go to college or tech school? Do I join Accelerate Church or join Accelerate Church? You have hard decisions. (laughs) That was good, wasn't it? This is an intrusive thought. I was like, I should say this. I am. You're going to have hard decisions. But I would say one of the most important things you can do is be patient. Be patient. Because a lot of the pain in our life has come from us 
having excessive speed with a lack of consideration. In the words of Rick Ross, <laughs> Ricky Rose, I don't want to move quickly, I want to move correctly. And some of us are moving quickly, but your quickly is to a lateral movement instead of a forward one. So what that's creating is sideways energy that is not ultimately preparing you or propelling you to your goal. So he's saying, be patient. Be patient in the paradoxes of life. Be patient in the pain of life. Be patient in the difficulty of life. And somebody is like, well, pastor, how long I got to be patient? Because I feel like I've been patient for a long time. This is what James says. He gives us a timetable. He says, be patient till the coming of the Lord. This is Advent season. Advent is about waiting. Christians believe this. Let me be your professor real quick. Christians believe that we are in, we are in the middle of something called the already but the not yet. Christ has already come and defeated death, sin, and hell on, and on the cross but we don't see the full fruition of that yet. We see and we take joy that he's already come in the form of a baby, that's Advent, but we're still waiting on him to come again with, his ta- with the tattoo down his leg, with the voice like a many waters and his eyes like a flame of fire and destroy his enemies, right? We're in that period of time. But while we wait for him to come back, we need to be patient. So what that means is that there is never a season of life in which you will not need to exhibit patience. No matter what season of life you're in, whether you're a kid going into middle school, whether you're a student going into college, regardless of where you are, you will have to exhibit patience. Does that make sense, friends? Now somebody's like, all right, pastor, well, how do we cultivate patience? Well, I'm so glad you asked. James decides... He's like, rather than telling you, I'm going to give you an illustration. So he gives us this illustration in verse 7. Here's what he says. In verse 7, he says, I want you to look to the farmer and the seed. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth and is patient until he receives the early and the latter rain. Um, As a pastor of this church, you may not know this, but I reserve the right to have the best car in the parking lot. Just going to tell you that right now. Right now, I have a 2005 Mazda MPV with 187,000 miles on it. It's clearly the best car in the parking lot. Clearly. Now I'm just playing. It's so bad that when I pull it up to the mechanic, he's like, when are you going to euthanize that car, pastor? When are you going to put that thing down? I'm like, yo, just fix the car, man, right? Fix the car, Sam. He's like, Poppy, I don't know about this thing. It's just, you, you keep bringing it in. You bring it in here every week. Can't you do better? I was like, yeah, but this one don't have a car note. The best thing I can do is keep my, my little bucket of rust running rather than getting a new one. Y- y'all ain't amen. It's all right. It's all right. You don't have to amen that. I'm secure. I'm secure in my raggedy car. You don't got to amen. You don't got to say nothing nice about that. I'm secure in that. I know somebody in this church that used to have a 98 Saturn, they're doing worse than I am. Anyway, anyway. (laughs) But the thing I love about mechanics is their mentality. A mechanic is immediately trying to identify the problem and then fix it, right? You could come in with your your car rattling. You could have all, all the problems in your car. They will do everything short of taking out the engine and make sure that they fix the issue. But a farmer is different. A farmer does not fix the problem. They allow the processes to play out over time. And here's what I want to encourage you. Some of you have to stop thinking like a mechanic and thinking more like a farmer. Oh, y'all, yeah, yeah, okay, 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 all right, okay, all right, all right. I work hard on that. Let me work hard. When the seed is sown into the ground, what can the farmer really do? Maybe throw out some fertilizer. I mean, I don't know. Everything is GMO now. Let's just assume that it's an organic crop here. What do they do? Just throw out some fertilizer? 
Maybe you can put out the little scarecrow that the birds just land on. I don't know, but the best thing you can do is allow the process to happen over time. And one of the worst things a farmer can do is try to intervene because the seed is not growing as quickly as it needs to. Because if that farmer tries to circumvent the process and take the seed out of the ground, what will happen is he will thwart that plant from growing and ultimately giving him the harvest, he or she, the harvest that they want over time. And the problem with some of us is we're trying to be a mechanic instead of a farmer. You just need to let the natural processes work at times. Like those people ridiculing you and criticizing you today, you don't need to respond with an email or, or some funny Facebook post. You know what you need to do? Just wait because many of them will not be in that same department with you in six months. The people criticizing you and saying all type of negative things about you, like you do not have to respond all the time. Sometimes you just have to let the thing play out. And I say that because some of you in here, you're worried about your children and you're worried about your career and you're worried about the next steps you're going to take in life. But let me just tell you, particularly if you're a follower of Jesus, you have sowed the seeds of hard work. You have sowed the seeds of trying to teach your child everything they can know about the scriptures and the Bible. You have worked diligently, gone and gotten your degree, or gone to tech school, or worked on your craft. The best thing you can do is know that you've thrown those seeds in the ground, you've covered it with the manure of hard times, you've prayed about it, and now you've got to believe that God is going to send the rain and that the soil is going to do its job. He waits for the early and the latter rain. The early rain is really a sign that the late rain is coming. And so sometime in life, you'll be working hard, and God will give you a little bit of early rain just to let you know, I'm still with you. I, I got your back. But even when that plant comes out of the ground, it still takes time to mature and grow. So I'm encouraging you, friends, be patient. Be patient like them. Here, this, here's the second thing. Here's the second illustration he gives us. He gives the illustration of prophets and Job. Look what he says in verse 10 and 11. He says, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance. Somebody say Job's endurance. And have seen the outcome the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, James decides here, that he wants to take us back to Sunday school. If you don't know what Sunday school is, typically before church, you would have like a two-hour session where they would teach you the Bible in the beginning. Well, he gives us a Bible study. Let me just scrap that. He gives us a Bible study here. He's like, yo, I want you to go look back to the prophets. Now, if you know anything about the prophets, here's what they did. They were messengers of God. They communicated biblical revelation. Uh, they foretold and they foretold the truth of God. And so he's like, I want you to go back to him. So, so we can look at Noah, for example. Noah was told, hey, I want you to build this huge boat, and I want you to build that because some rain is coming that's going to flood the earth. So he built it for 120 years and looked like he was, uh, he, he was mentally unstable when that was happening until the rain came. We look at Joseph. Joseph was a young man that was very arrogant and prideful in the Bible, he had this dream that his mom and his dad were going to bow down to him and all that type of stuff. And what happened with him was even though he was destined to deliver Israel out of Egyptian captivity, he was delivered to a pit and sent in prison for two decades. Two decades. Isaiah. Isaiah was another person that was considered a prophet. He shared God's word. He taught in Isaiah 53, he talks about the beauty of this coming savior that's going to be, that's going to be a victorious king. And you would think after that, after these beautiful lyrics, you would think that he would have a platinum album at the end of his life where they would take all the lyrics from Isaiah 53 and they would put it into an album. That's not what happened to him, y'all. An unfaithful king put him in a log and sawed him in two. Are y'all with me, sir? Are y'all with me? I know y'all like, nah, get to the good part. I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. Jeremiah was submerged in a pit until, up, up until his neck. Like, and then there's a lot of debate over who's the GOAT right now in basketball. Of course, I believe it's LeBron James. Bron Bron? Bron Bron? Of course. Like, what's that other guy's name? Michael what? Michael Johnson? What's his name? Whatever. Gosh, man, come on. Y'all, tough crowd today. These jokes ain't, 
Jokes ain't joking, huh? Mm. Mm, Jordan. My, Jordan, Michael, Michael Je- Jeffrey Johnson. Mm. But there's, there, there's some debate over the goat in basketball, but here's the thing. There's no debate in the goat of suffering in the Bible. Job is LeBron James of suffering. LeBron Jordan of suffering. How's that? Michael James of suffering. How does that make that make that makes you feel better, right? It's the Kobe of suffering here. There you go. That makes me feel better. Y'all terrible today. I don't even remember where I'm at. What was I even saying? Oh yes, yes. So Job experienced all type of pain, body pain. He lost his family. He lost his marriage. Like all of these dudes had long stretches of darkness, but yet in the middle of their suffering, this passage, James says that they are blessed. Would you think that Daniel in the lion's den is blessed? Would you think that Paul in chains in Rome is blessed? Here's why. Because what you diagnose as pain in one season can can often be a blessing in another season. But what you need is to have perspective and patience. Like, I know you went through that breakup in that one season, and you were like, oh, my God, I thought this was going to work out. And then a few years later, you were like, you know what? That worked out for the better. (laughs) Thank God. Because my life would have been much different if I was involved. You were like, oh, man, I was hoping I was going to graduate with this particular degree. And then somehow, it was some problems, and the economy changed, and that degree that you looked down on actually was one that was favorable. Or you were like, man, I don't know. I want to go to college like the rest of my friends. But then tech school popped up, and now you realize that, oh, they do still need welders. Oh, they still do need electricians. Oh, AI is not taking my job because they can't wire and use all these different things. What I'm saying is something you would consider as a burden and pain in one season can actually be a blessing and an open door from God in another season, but you must have patience. You got to have patience. And that tells us also, don't judge a season too early before it's over. I know a young lady, or remember a story of a young lady, she cried for two years straight, and she she was manic depressive. She couldn't even work for a living. She just cried and bawled tears, and she didn't really have any insurance, so she couldn't go to the doctor, but eventually she got her job, and she went to the doctor one day after it ended, uh, and, and she went to an optometrist, and the optometrist said to her, wow, there is something going on with your tear ducts. Because if you did not do any incessant crying, you could have potentially lost your eyesight. What I'm saying is, yeah, it might be a burden in one season, but that burden God can use as a means of blessing you in another season. But like you thought that when you were going through all that trauma and all that pain and all the difficulty, well, that trauma equipped you to do something and empower somebody and propel somebody else. to. I I know you were worried because you were like, man, I'm really struggling with this because I didn't have the mom that I want and I didn't have the dad that I want. I don't have the family members and the support that I want, but God used that as a means of building you up, strengthening you, and when you run into other people that feel orphaned and abandoned in life, he's giving you to tools that you need in order to comfort them, you've got to have patience. Patience. I'm glad you're clapping. Because then he says, how do you know that you're not exercising patience? It's in verse 9. Look what it says. Don't grumble against one another. I know we don't have problems with this in this church. And I know none of you have ever grumbled against somebody else. But let's just, let's just go through it for a second. It says, don't grumble against one another's brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Here's the thing about grumbling. Many of us have gone through hard seasons of life, right? Difficult, difficult seasons where we really didn't think we were going to have a way out. And during those times, it's natural to wonder, particularly if you're a follower of Jesus, where's God at during this season? Where's he at when I'm experiencing a stillbirth? Where's he at when I'm experiencing joblessness and untold pain? God, where are you in those seasons? Well, when you have those, that sorrow and you express it to God, you know what it's called? Lamentation. 
is communicating your sorrow and you being upset about a season of life towards God. But grumbling is when you experience that same season and it pushes you away from God. It's when you say something, when you say something explicitly, but you really say it under your breath, like, oh, see, this is why I didn't want to come to church anyway. See, this is why I want to come here anyway. But then once you, but in public, you're like, oh, yeah, everything is good. Everything's wonderful. That's grumbling. He's saying a lot of times when we're upset with God, we let it spill out on other people. When we're upset with something that has happened in our spiritual lives, we take it out on other people. That's why we like, you know what? I got time today to answer you. I'm going to have a conversation with you today. It's because that person, has that ever happened to anybody in here? Well, you're like, what? I just asked the question, why are you going off on me like this? Oh, your problem is not with me. Oh, it's something that happened in your life, and I'm just going to be your punching bag. God is like, hey, I don't want you to treat people like your punching bags because you're dissatisfied with something that he's done in your life. That's patience. And then he goes on, for instance. So my, somebody might be like, and you, you can come, I'm finished on this one. You, the, the, somebody might be like, well, pastor, what can I do to have patience? Like, what can I do? What, what is something I can do? Here's what I want to encourage you to do. First thing is I want you to look backwards in your life. Look backwards. There are times in our lives where each of us, despite whether you're deconstructing or whether you're experiencing, the, you're experiencing a relationship with God for a time, there are times where you can look back and say, God, you have been good to me. You have protected me and you have kept me in ways that I've never seen before. The, 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 the primary way as Christians we believe the thing that we celebrate about the birth of Jesus is that it led to one of the best events that has ever happened, which is Christ going to the cross on our behalf. It's like, listen, we had a relationship with God that has been cut off because of the misdeeds that we've done. But because Jesus decides to be a volunteer, rather than allowing us to pay for our sins and the things that we've done for an eternity, he decides that he's going to take over and pay it off for us anyway. So he dies on a Friday, resurrects on a Sunday, but on that Saturday, that's where many of us are at in life. We're in the silent Saturday of life right now, in between the problem and the solution, in between the pain, and the resolution. And we're wondering, when are things going to change? I don't know when things will change, but here's what I want to let you know. That resurrection is coming. That if you don't faint, if you don't get weary, and you just wait, God promises that he will establish you, that he will build you up, and that he will give you what you need when you endure that pain. Here's the second one. You not only look backwards, but I want to encourage some of us to look inward. This is what he says. He says, I want you to strengthen your heart. You know how you strengthen your heart in physical terms? Cardio, weight training, working out, getting off the couch, getting your behind out there and working out. I don't know if I can say that or not. I had some other intrusive thoughts, but I just, I just, I just just corralled them. But that's what he's saying. One of the ways that you strengthen your heart is by working out your body. And I'm saying that one of the things that maybe God is doing while we're being patient is he wants, to work, he wants us to work on our spiritual cardio. Maybe he wants you to work on your resilience. You're just not resilient enough. With every level that comes in your life of promotion comes a level of pain that many of us are just not ready for yet. You're not ready for people to walk out on you yet. You can only be promoted to the portion, to the place of your pain threshold. So he's saying, work on your cardio. How do you work on your cardio? Maybe it's you joining the dream team. Maybe it's you finally going through growth track. Maybe it's you participating with 21 days of prayer and fasting that's happening in January with us. What I'm saying is maybe God is using this season to kind of help you develop your cardio so that you can be the type of spiritually fit person that you've always wanted to be. Here's the last one, is he wants you to look up. Look up. Now somebody's saying, Pastor, you know, I don't know, like I don't, I don't know if I can be patient. I'm such an impatient person. What if I mess up? What if I fall short of the ideal? Here's what I want to let you know is that you don't have to be patient in your own strength. You can rely on the greatest example of patience, who is Jesus, who waited in heaven 
for the perfect time to become a little born baby born in a manger in Bethlehem, who, who, who was patient as he grew up in his stature and grew in his knowledge, who was patient with his family that despised him, his disciples that misunderstood him, and the crowds that only wanted what they can get from him. He was patient. He was patient as he endured public scorn. But here's what I want you to know, is that on the cross, Jesus exhibits perfect patience by suffering on the cross for our constant impatience. He suffers for us. Listen, I love you, but I ain't going to jail for you. Matter of fact, I'm telling. <laughs> Feds come to my house, don't, don't rely on me to lie for you. Don't rely on me. That's not, that's not what I'm going to do. I might let somebody write me a nasty email on your behalf. What was I even saying? Like, how do I? I got to do better. I really got to. This is what I'm trying to say. Even though other people will not experience punishment for you, Jesus was willing to go to the cross and endure all the unjust punishments that you and I should have experienced. And he did that so that now when the Father looks at us, he's not upset and angry. In fact, he can be patient with us. So I want to encourage you this season, not only this holiday season, but as you go into 2024, and as many of us are looking forward to what's to come, some of us are apprehensive about it. What I do know is without regard to where you are in your life, one thing you're going to have to exhibit in this season is patience. Be patient with people. Be patient when you have to make the hard decisions. Be patient with yourself because you're not a fully developed product yet. But God, here's the beautiful thing, He's not done with you yet. He's not done with you. And maybe you came here today and, you know, on this Christmas, and we're so happy that you're here. We want to give you the opportunity to accept Jesus and to grow and to know him. One of the ways that you can do that is by filling out that Connect card, giving us as much information as you feel comfortable with. And there's a box at the end that just says, hey, I want to explore what it's like to experience this relationship with Jesus. We would love to take you through those next steps. Maybe you want to make this your church family. We have growth track at the end of the gathering. Either way, we would love for you to take your next step and get closer to God that created you and made you. Amen. Why don't you bow your heads? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much. Thank you for this great group of people. I pray that you will bless them, that you would give them wisdom. Lord, I pray that they will have a great holiday season, that this year will be packed with Yuletide cheer, and that they will have everything they need in order to be successful in 2024. Lord, we love you. We honor you in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, why don't you say amen? Amen. amen.